Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here. My name is Lilvia Cross. Um, I am an independent curator and art advisor, and I'm here today to introduce you to my work on the building, um, on this building that you're standing in, Third Bank site. And for this excited project, I selected over 35 artworks by 21 artists, each with some kind of connection to the Bronx and New York, whether they grew up here or work here. The Bronx has participated, as we all know, in the growth of some of the most important artists and intellectuals of our time. Um, and reflecting that growth here was very important to me. Therefore, artworks by emerging and established artists hang alongside one another. We're excited to feature paintings, photographs, and sculptures that have previously been ex exhibited in museums, galleries, and other cultural staples, alongside pieces by freshly graduated students. Tonight, I'm thrilled to introduce two of the wonderful artists uh, that are included in this connection. We have Bahar Behbahani <laughs> and Rico Gadsen. Bahar was born in Tehran in Iran and is now based in Brooklyn. And I discovered Baha's work through the Wave Hill Arts Program here in the Bronx. Her research-based practice approaches landscape as a metaphor for politics and poetics. Through her paintings, cultures, and videos, and also public installations, she aims to gather and unify people. She's a recipient of the Creative Capital Award for Anticipated Project, is a fond flowers only once, as well as a 2020 fellow for the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptures Grant, which are both big deals. Her work was included in exhibitions all over the country and internationally at the Drawing Center in New York, the Charger Arts Foundation, the United Emirates, and Queens Museum just to name a few. And her work is in the collection of multiple institutions from Australia to Iran. Rico Getson was born in Georgia and he's a multimedia artist based in Brooklyn. Like many of you, I'm sure, um, I discovered Rico's work taking the subway through his monumental mural at the 167th Street subway station here in the Bronx. And over the course of almost two decades, he's become celebrated for his confrontational and politically opinionated works, often based on significant moments in black history. His work is exhibited nationally and internationally and is in the permanent collections of the Studio Museum in Harlem, Cross River, the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC, and the Yale University Art Gallery. And again, just name a few, not gonna you know, list the hundreds of exhibition history for both of these wonderful artists. And finally, a very special guest is Sandra Bloodworth, uh, who is the director of the award-winning public art program at the MTA in Arts and Designs, uh, which, you know, to put it simply, she's the reason we all have incredible artworks all over the city. <laughs> she's joined the program in 1988, which is three years after it was launched, and you know, really turning New York Transportation Network into a first-rate museum, exposing millions of transit writers to art, music, and poetry. She's also the co-author of the book New York's Underground Museum and the recipient of the 2005 Alfred Lone Award for Public Service and the 2015 Gary Melker's Medal for the Artist Fellowship. Without further ado, <laughs> welcome everybody. I think they can all be applause. So first question, um, you know, both Rico and Bahar, you guys have very different practices. You work both in the studio as well as on bigger, larger scale installation. So I'm curious about what and how did you get to making those large installation, the public art installation? Maybe we can start with you, Bahar. Sure. Um, it's actually I'm wondering too, <laughs> because I am a painter. I've been a painter for many years, as much as I remember. We don't talk about ages. It's better not to talk about numbers. <laughs> but um, when I think about it, that how come I started doing like public art or better say like community oriented work, I think it came out as like some sort of urge that I felt personally. Um, as a as an immigrant, I think I I was always like longing for having a community that is meaningful, and it's beyond like being in the art world or any industry. So, what is that tribe that I 
want to be a part of. And it's been always like something between here and there when you migrate, right? So I, you want just to make some sort of root and trim it and cultivate it and get like the whole tribe with you. So one of the things that came to me very naturally was like maybe if I make my own community um, through my artwork, I can make that uh, kinship in a way. So that's how I came out from studio a little bit and started the public work. And started, I have a reference here that you actually sent to me, uh -huh. which is maybe like something that you definitely didn't work on because it opened That's 200 years ago. That's actually interesting. This is, um, if people can see it in this really beautiful, bright uh, sun, but um, this is an aerial view from one of the gardens in Iran. And it's good to know that where I come from and it's important for me I always just get grounded when I see this picture because this is like everything. This is like about land. This is about the water management. This is about the, when we're talking about Persian gardens, it immediately comes like an oasis, a romantic idea, but also for me is the dignity and integrity of people that they brought, let's say, water from kilometers of kilometers in this a uh, deserted area. So it, it talks about like ancestral wisdom. It mm -hmm. comes about like, talks about like knowledge and the people that they are dedicated, that they have like this knowledge. So it's, it's my relationship with water. So when I came to New York, imagine like how I felt between like <laughs> all these rivers. So I think it's important to just, um, just keep that relationship, mm -hmm. that's where you come from and then what waterways means to you. And that's how like my work is centered around gardens and waters in a, in a metaphorical way, but also literally about that. Um, about Rico, how about you? How do you think you got into working on a public installation? Hi, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. Um, and happy to be on this wonderful panel. And so I'm delighted that, um, to be invited to speak um, with Lolita, who I'm a fan of, and of course here at um, this beautiful building in Brookville um, properties, um, and to have a work in the collection. Um, so for me, like, uh, uh, it wasn't like an easy sort of, uh, or a, an obvious, uh, translation of what I do um, um, prior to this project, I should say, um, in the studio to like um, um, the public realm or public space, um, with the exception of the project that was presented. Um, I, had, um, I have some history um, insofar as uh, uh, I had applied um, or submitted a proposal for something and so prior, and, but it was really the project um, in the Bronx that really excited me and, um, and uh, so it seemed possible that I could translate what I do yes. um, That's the one. again from the studio, uh, which were these works on paper that I have been making that uh, are portraits of significant persons of color historically. So from there, it, ma it made sense. So I went to the site in the Bronx and um, spent a lot of time in um, my preparation uh, for the proposal. And, uh, and yeah, so it just made sense. You know, I, I wanted to do something that was, you know, uh, upon my research, I wanted to do something that, that, you know, I felt that the community could be really uh, proud of and um, the, the community and beyond, I should say. Um, but, um, so yeah, so it, this is all like struggling to say that it wasn't like an easy sort of um, or direct uh, path for me from there to there until right. this opportunity arose. And um, obviously we're delighted with the results. How did you perceive translating a work that's, you know, 25 by 36 inches to something that's so wide scale? Like, did you think about the materials a lot? Were you thinking about how it would read from across the platform? All of the above, but 
there are a few stages that, uh, in the development of the project, obviously. Um, one of the great things in so far as thinking about community is that uh, you're fortunate if you're in a community of, of artists that, that you, you're speaking with, engaging with, and, uh, um, and in this case, <laughs> I was talking to a very good friend of mine, a, a really important artist to me, and thinking about the project in its uh, development stage, and they were like, um, and maybe you're hearing this for the first time, but they were like, those radiating drawings would be amazing. Project it. And it was like, and I think that that was the moment where I was like, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. And immediately uh, translated like one of the drawings into the space. Um, and I was like, wow. But I should share this with my partner in crime, my partner in life, my wife, who's in the audience. And she was like, amazing. It's like, amazing. So like through this community, through this engagement, through, through all of that, like, so we arrive here. That's also all to say that like, you know, we don't do this in a vacuum, you know, like I would like to be considered uh, um, a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, but you know, but it, it's it's through like, you know, it's it's not we're not just a you know uh, an island, um, but um, so yeah, it, so it was a few steps, and once I could see it, then it was just like, you know, let's go, and so. So you applied for the a specific project was the application well, was process. Like. Yeah, I was well, I, I was invited to sort of submit a proposal, wow. and with the group of other artists and um, um, so yeah then it was a competition and then fortunately um, they selected my project um, but uh, well there's no but I, I'm thrilled that that was the case and that <laughs> um, and then there was a long process a long but quick process to go from like um, um, conceptualization yeah. to actual practice production project and uh, suffice to say it was uh, nothing short of a, a miracle I'd like to share that <laughs> even though um, it may not be again something that people want to hear but it, it really happened so um, so it was pretty magical yeah, the whole the whole thing wow. working with Sandra working <laughs> with the team Lydia my point person yeah. and uh, the whole thing was pretty amazing so, you know, and, and you know, I've, I've done a few projects since then, you know, that were not in the same uh, realm, but, um, but this project was, you know. So that was your introduction was, to public art. Yeah. You started with that one. Yeah, and, you know, I still think that I'm, 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 hoping, I'm hoping for more things to, to happen. Um, and I'm, and, uh, but for me, it's like just the, the idea has to kind of I have to be able to see it. I have to be able right. to project yeah, yeah. It into space and see that it can work or translate um, into something. So uh, the good news is, is I'm thinking a lot about things. <laughs> more, more, more projects now, I should say, <laughs> to be more specific. How about you, Sandra? How did you get to work on public art how was it were you drawn from a curatorial perspective were you drawn from a community perspective what got you to do what you do now um well first i want to just say thank you for that beautiful introduction that was so kind Welcome. and uh, while i would love to take credit for all this remarkable collection of artwork it's it's a team that does just a phenomenal job it, with every detail is important and I'm joined tonight by Deputy Director Cheryl Hagman, uh, right here, who is a key part of that team. Um, but I came to New York in 1980. I'm an artist. I came as an artist to you know, pursue my painting. And the first place I remember being in a public was the 34th Penn Station 123 Station. And I'd been in New York a few days, and I was trying to find my way to the Lower East Side where I knew someone. And I looked around that station, and the, I don't know if some of you may remember that the columns there, the, the, the were sort of bubblegum pinks, just a hot pink. 
And, and there were these beautiful mosaics. And it just, everything felt off, and you know what the stations look like with graffiti and with damage and vandalism and falling apart. And yet you could see that historic fabric. And I stood there as an artist looking like, how could anybody let this happen? How could they do that? And it turned out the mayor's wife, Phyllis Wagner, had actually selected those colors on a palette that were randomly put around, you know. And this just can't be. So fast forward about eight years later, I had the opportunity to apply for this uh, position. I worked with the first, they had, we had a temporary program. Carrie uh, is here who was one of the first artists that I, I worked with. As she's been in the South Bronx all these years. Um, and so I had that introduction that we could make, uh, it could be different. Mm -hmm. And then I was given that opportunity. And it became great was the art, but it also was the design, the look of the stations, all this. It was a holistic thing that could happen. And with a number of people, not just our team, but you know, the MTA at that point in the, in the 80s, the system was falling apart. And there were people who had figured out the finance and they believed this could change. And there were visionaries that, um, such as Rone Mitchell, the first director was Wendy Foyer, um, and they became part of this greater team that all believed we could turn this place around. And what a challenge it was. And, you know, we all are going through very tough times now if you look at the news every night. Mm -hmm. But we started in very tough times. And this, the system is nowhere was where it was then. And the hope is still there. It's going to come back. It's going to, you're going to feel good there again. Uh, though you'll never admit it, even when you do, you're going to feel good again. And there are dedicated people working every day now to change that. The big part of this was the public art. The public art was the sign of what everyone saw. And I came out of a, you know, as an artist, but I had also worked in all kind of programs where we took art into, uh, for at-risk youth, we had art, and I had worked on a, a program that was very involved with community. And we knew that community must be key to this. And so the first thing we understood is, who are we doing? Why is the MTA doing art? And who are we doing it for? And we are doing that. We say this for every process we do to the panel that selects, which is arts professionals, advisory from the community, and to the artists that are finalists. We, they, we say this over and over. Why is the MTA commissioning art? It is for the people who use this place to engage people in this place and by doing so to also transform that place to somewhere special. The art brings that unique thing that engages you and makes, it makes you present as you travel. Some projects more than others. But it takes the system to a new place. There are now over 350 artworks permanent in both the subway and rail stations. I want to tell you in the Bronx, there are 52 artists have been selected. 48 of those stations are completed. And then those that I'm not even counting are, are four brand new projects that were just beginning that are huge for pen access with Metro North, a whole new way to get to Manhattan in a fraction of the time. And so it's a, it's, it is a Budding, a, a seed was planted, and look at what has bloomed. Mm -hmm. One other thing to just tell you, in those, those 52 artists are about 50-50 male and female, and 80%, listen to this again, I said 80% are BIPOC and women. That, that is another way that the program is so much about community, about reflecting the people who use this yeah. place. That's pretty incredible. So you, you were just talking about the, the audience, because there is an audience, the whole point of public art. How much, and this is a question for all of you guys, how much do you think about the audience when you're making that work, when you're, when you're thinking about how people are gonna interact with it, how it might be vandalized, how it might be perceived? how it will be used and, and you know, actually used, like how it will fade and all of that. Do you, 
Do you guys think about that? Bahar, I know your work is different because it's actually meant to be seated and, and touched and, and kind of um, embraced in that way. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I don't know if um, when I start working, um, I don't think about like particularly audience, but the first question for me is like, if I'm working something in public, who's the public? Right. That's the most important thing for me because I don't want just to go out as like the privileged artist that doing something and putting something somewhere. It's, mm -hmm. That's not that I'm going through all these difficulties yeah. to come out from my studio and then I, I just really want to <clears throat> um, to go to the research of the demographically and like see like again like who's the public that I'm working for and what it brings to all of us so to be able to do that because I don't have always the answer so I have to learn with the audience that who's the audience and I think because I'm not trained as a public artist anyway I'm a painter and just I'm a I'm people. <laughs> so I go out and I put myself, I think, in kind of like, I would say, vulnerable position and open and just listen to the public that I want to create work for them. And then we go together from there. So I just, it's just like an interaction with, they collaborate with my research, not even sometimes they're knowing that they're collaborating, but like I put them in the position that they feel like the agency of like thinking, rethinking, right. imagining, like in terms of like the work that I did in the Bronx at the Wayfield Garden. They wanted me to do something that is related to Hudson River, of course, because Wayfield Garden is, if you've been there, it's just a beautiful view of the Hudson River and they were really like hoping that we all doing with the interns and all these volunteers and the research um, already, like the group that they are in the garden, uh, bringing more visibility to what's happening in Hudson River in terms of like ecology aspect of it and all this. But when I just went to the, um, that particular geography and one thing that I have to say is just like I walk a lot and walking is part of understanding things for me. So <clears throat> I walked from Brooklyn to the Bronx to understand like the geography, the land, the, the transformation, the people, the how, how these things just like really changing to this scenery. Mm -hmm. So it's important for me just either walk or just going by ferry. So uh, of course, sovereign is very water dear every time. to me, but like uh, for the point of like research for the public and outside and things, I really like want to feel the ground under my feet. Mm -hmm. And I start from there. So I just walked a lot, like for a month I was walking around the whole area. And um, it's actually through like talking with people and going back again to who I am, that what I want to tell about Hudson River to these people as an artist. And I realized that I don't have any memory because I'm not from here. So I know everything as a research-based artist about <laughs> Hudson River, but I, I don't know the smell of the Hudson River very good, but I know the smell of Karun River in Iran. I know like the, all the issues around Karun River. So that made me feel like, okay, let's just ask people that they're working here, do they have any memory from Hudson River or, is, or are they also like came from some other places and they just ended up here? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that actually nobody had any memories because they were all like young people that mostly like immigrants and, um, but they just got like really bright when I asked them, so which river you want to talk about? And then the other rivers just came. And the idea came to me that actually locality is about glo being global mm -hmm. and, and these are like integrating to each other. So we can't just be super hyper local, not to looking at the general thing. So I propose that bringing 
seven other rivers to be in conversation with Hudson River. That's how um, Mississippi River came um, to the conversation first because um, I really started the whole um, workshop and the session with the people with um, my um, literally beloved Toni Morrison's and people just um, were reading um, things about around like memory um, that comes from the essay of Toni Morrison and things just you know, just started from there. And then we had like Ganges, um, you know, other rivers. So that's how, just in a nutshell, mm -hmm. things just started. That what the audience, audience, who's the audience and what they say and what they want to do with that. After yeah, that. for you it's almost bringing them in and be active participant instead of just seeing the finished project. Yeah, and it's also for some works that they're not like, they're kind of ephemeral because it's got a time for the kind of like this work that I did in, in the Wayfield. It was like eight months work and then they were deinstalling it. So what's the impact yeah. for those people that they were involved in making it? That's really important mm -hmm. for me. The pedagogical aspect of the work is really important for me. The informal gatherings, even if it's a tea gathering around the work. So the work for me is an excuse, really, to just yeah. create a platform that people can come together and talk about other things. Yeah. yeah. Very educational. What do you think about that, Rika? First off, I want to say that was really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm an artist, so I'm always thinking about, like, audience, um, th the viewer. We all are. I mean, obviously, I'm not taking away from, like, in the community, but... So, like, that's first and foremost um, for me. So, uh, so there's, like, the general of taking it into the public, uh, thinking about the viewer, um, and uh, as one makes the work, um, and but then it's the specificity of the project, this project, um, um, and I'm gonna try to articulate in, or express this in a way that hopefully makes sense for y'all. So uh, again, like that's paramount. It's like I have to be feel like one that I'm, I, I'm engaged in two that I can like sort of um, that I can produce something that is going to be of interest uh, to the viewer, but I'm thinking about the viewer, I'm thinking about the audience in this specific case, uh, or of the, in terms of the specific uh, project in the Bronx. Um, again, I came up with the idea, I decided that I could project and that it was going to work, and, and then there was another process of selecting the figures, which is something that, again, occurs in the studio, had been occurring for many years. Um, in this case, I was thinking, I, I began to think about the demographics of, 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 of place, uh, of space, the people that, be, that, that would um, active, activate or interact or be in that space. So then it, that led to the obvious, uh, um, that led to me actually going to the site, being in the site, um, being with the people, sort of like um, quietly. You know, I'm a commuter, so it wasn't like the, you know, so I would just go up, go up and spend time and see the families and, um, and just sort of uh, absorb the energy of, uh, the people moving in and out of space. Mind you, they had no, no uh, participation in the selection of the figures, of the, of the, the individuals that would eventually be uh, portrayed. But um, I tried to be sensitive in so far as who I selected. Um, I didn't want it to be a, a literal um, I, I wanted it to be, you know, literal and specific, but um, there are a couple wild cards, but... Like who? Well, Maya Angelou, maybe. She's not from the Bronx. 
but I believe um, there's a connection. Um, uh, so, but without getting into that, because I don't want to draw this out too too much, but Reggie Jackson clearly is, you know, an obvious choice um, uh, because of, of course, um, the what's that? The Yankees, yeah, the Yankees, which was one stop um, below. Um, Audre Lord, I think, is a good example of again not an obvious choice being from across the river, um, but. Uh, Again, there's like a part that I like to talk about that I'm not going to get into too deep here, but there's like a spiritual sort of aspect of how I process um, and how I make work. Um, and I'm using that very generic, generically um, for the purposes of getting through this. But um, when I was thinking about like who the subjects would be, because we had a certain amount, um, I think there were going to be eight total. We started with six from my um, proposal. Um, but then, like, I was trying to decide after I knew I was going to do the commission on who the other two would be, and uh, somehow Audrey Lord was in the mix because I might have said something about Audrey Lord at some point. And but I started to work, and this was occurring in the summer of 2018, I believe. And uh, um, uh, and my wonderful partner again, who I mentioned, who's in the audience. Um, got me a book for our, our anniversary, uh, which was Audre Lorde's uh, Sister Outsider. And we were on vacation, and I was reading <laughs> through, like, um, reading the first essay. I think it was uh, um, set in Moscow. Um, and uh, Aud Audrey had made a reference to, like, being on the Grand Concourse at 160 um, First Street. and. And uh, long story short, <laughs> it was like, you know, boom. And I was like, there it is. I'm, you know, I could dramatize it a little bit more. <laughs> and I have, but, you know, but it just made sense. You know, so, the, so that was important. Um, but of course, everybody, every, uh, all of the portraits weren't selected because they were it, it, it doesn't matter that, that they were selected um, or that they weren't from the Bronx, ultimately, because they're clearly internationally yeah. recognized um, persons, uh, artists, um, and so on. But I thought, I, was, I hoped that, that the community, that the audience would be appreciative. Again, like when you're making work, when you're when you're sitting in your studio trying to figure out what to do, um, how how to sort of take something from like concept to completion to the physical thing in the world, um, it's not always easy to know that that what the reaction is going to be, what the response is going to be, and so I can I can say that I was, and hopefully this is not sharing too much or revealing too much, but I was overwhelmingly surprised with the response <laughs> wow. of that project. So, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it seems like a no brainer now. Um, maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but, <laughs> but I was really happy that, um, yeah, with that the people outcome. people were happy with well, it. Well, yeah, the, the people responded so well to it. Right. You know? But, cause you know, we sit, you know, I'm sitting in the studio most, most of the time. I mean, I have an assistant or sometimes two that were, that I'm working with, but it's still like a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're in there working, um, and and trying to produce work. Uh, so it's not always obvious the, the the response that might come from the audience. I mean, of course. clearly, you, clearly, you hope it's good, you know. And but can I say something yeah, here? Um, it's very beautiful that what you say, and it's just really I can feel it when you say like audience really just got like overwhelming feedback. I think it's really about like how you th do things uh, versus like what's the final product. And the yeah. way that you explain the whole soul and the whole like this emotional back and forth with Audre Lorde and these, these stories that you bring 
these are these shows and this goes to the soul of the work and i really highly believe in that and i think people get that that vibration it's more than just like you did a research you work something and it goes on the wall it's it's beyond that it's um so it's really beautiful it's all about that I yeah it, the oh, process process the the journey i like to say um but then once it's installed, you, you guys also have to deal with people living with it for forever. I mean, that's, you, you do something that's very special is that you, you place works that are permanently there. And so it's not like one exhibition that people like on the moment and they move on and you have another exhibition and you move on. It's, it's those works are gonna be there. And right now we've seen, you know, in the past few years, such a rebellion against certain monuments and people's response to it after it's been there for hundreds of years or even decades. And that's something that, that you must think about, Sandra, as, as putting those pieces up and selecting, you know, who they're going to be representing, what they're going to be talking about. How do you deal with that? And have you also ever encountered something that was problematic, you know, after decades of the work being exhibited? Yes, I don't know that I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> you don't have to, but it's, it's an interesting concept. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure now you might, you... I might tell it. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the earlier part of the question and then come there. Uh, because both Behar and Rico are touching on things that are so critical to this process. And it, it is the thing we have, you know, part of our process is the orientation with the artist. And by the time we get there, this happens with this selection panel, but it also happens with the artist through the process, which is our, our, whoever's managing the project does an extreme, I mean extreme deep dive into the community, into the history of the community and creates a presentation about that community. Now the community is gonna be part of this panel. So we're presenting to people their community. And of course, we always say, you know your community better than we do. So, but we've done this research, research for ourselves. How can we commission a work if we don't know your community and your place? So they're almost always, I would say always, just sort of blown away the depth of the research that has happened before we even start. And so, once the, so it's grounding everyone in that selection of where this work is going and who the work is created. We get into demographics, we get into the history, the change of the Democrats. Uh, we talk about, you know, 40 years from now, it won't be the same, you know, demographics. So that's all part of, you know, what has happened, what is important, everything we can find. But then we also share that same presentation with the artists that come in to propose. And again, just to, maybe the artist is from a place and or maybe they they are not but either way there's always something in there that people start that starts to resonate and what we say we don't we we never ever and this has been hard to to make sure it happens we do not give themes to artists we don't that's the best way to me to stifle an artist's whole process mm -hmm. um, but what we do is to ground the artist in the place have them see and, and start to experience this and take them to the site if it's an existing station or to the place. And then we talk a little bit about if they're artists that have not worked in the public realm, particularly this was true early on in the program. Uh, we talk about, your, you have your work in your studio, but we want you here to be very mindful. Look at who lives there. Look at who comes through the station, who works there, who, this is who you're creating this for. And it's very different than the process you have in your studio. But while you're doing that, know that this panel selected you because you are where the magic happens. You are where all this information, where it's research like Bahar, um, it's the, all the things that you come together, bring together in your practice we want this information that you're now gathering about the place to then funnel through you and your process and something come out of it that we could never, ever, ever imagined. And what's been so great is often 
you know with panels when you have uh, you have a lot of disparate people from say a different com a particular community is to sort of share this process in a way they fully participate you know it is a procurement ultimately the voting arts panel makes the final decision but the community representatives who are sent to represent the community we say lobby lobby these arts professionals why talk about and what almost always happens is that arts panel lobbies the community. They start to That's understand true. why. And, and they, you know, it happened, it happened last week in a panel where someone came with strong personality and, and they left going, I love this process. <laughs> and because the arts professionals, who most often represent geographically, they listen. And they're, they're, we all listen, and that's what people want to be heard. They want to know they got to express what they feel about their communities, their community. And then they see the thoughtful response from the arts professionals, and everyone almost always comes together. And out of that have come wonderful selections about, about the artwork. Just briefly to say it's our responsibility from the beginning was that the work be durable that it lasts, that it be there. If it didn't, you think the MTA is going to spend more money on something that's, you know, and frankly, I, I, we don't have, as Cheryl is responsible for the maintenance of all these, um, and lately it's been pretty much her and, and a couple people who do a thousand other things, um, but we're addressing that, but um, it has to be there physically and in pretty good shape. So we deal with very durable materials and they are materials you know, mosaics. If, if man or nature doesn't in, intervene, they're fair forever. And now we're doing a lot of glass, but the glass that's laminated. Um, so we're, we're very conscious of that. Um, and we do hope those of you that, that have seen some of the work, you, do, you go your regular route, but we hope you will go out. We have a beautiful new website in progress that you can go see all those Bronx projects. But go out and, and tour these works and see these works and experience them. Yeah, they're really beautiful. And the way they interact with the space itself, which every subway turns out to be a different structure with very different architecture. So the way you guys integrate it is definitely beautifully done. Um, I'm curious about if you guys grew up with seeing a public artwork that blew your mind or a garden that blew your mind. I know, I know you were kind of raised in a garden. So you, know, you can talk about that if you want or if arriving to New York, you also had a change of heart about a concrete jungle and what that <laughs> says about a garden. Um, yeah, it's... When I came to New York, I definitely, like, something is so New York is community gardens, right? So it's just like you just come and just are, oh, it's everywhere buildings. No, there are community gardens. So everybody is proud of like the community gardens in each neighborhood. And I was just so happy for a while. Yes, community gardens. Uh, but then um, my mother, that I'm very lucky that she's here uh, in the <laughs> audience with me, she came to America like a couple of years ago um, maybe five years ago, and then I was just so excited, and I said, there are community gardens, <laughs> and I can take you there. And she was like, okay, so let's go to community gardens. And I didn't really, like, after all these years that I've been in America, I didn't realize that how I actually lost my, or just like I tried just to, you know, emerge to the society or something, but, I forgot like what garden means to us mm -hmm. and what the community garden characteristic in New York is just like different. We're not talking about like a value, bad and good, right? It's different. Mm -hmm. So when the first time I observed actually my mother in the community garden, I realized that, oh, this is not the garden that I grew up in and this is not the interaction with the setting of the community garden. It's um, um, this needs like another conference anyway, because I'm kind of like a, I feel like I have like the, all my life like dedicated to the garden and Persian gardens, but the philosophy of the garden and the way that we go together and we sit together and the ways of like the setting of the, all the um, plants and the meaning of them 
and the circulation of water, it's definitely something different. The experiential aspect of it, that how you listen to the sound of water, it's not just like as a practical thing, but it's just the poetry that we live in. That's something that it was missing for me. Yeah. Where is the poetry? Oh no, there are vegetables here. We can just eat them. No, but where is the poetry? Yeah. So for a couple of years, I've been just um, thinking and thinking and finally I was just like, let's just build a garden. <laughs> so that's my very high ambitious future um, next adventure that I'm going to build a Which garden. Which is a sketch, right? Um, these are just some sketches that, the yeah, um, it's not revealed yet, but um, a good news for all the New Yorkers is like it's under review and it's gonna be a permanent garden and it's going to be in Governor's Island. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so the dream comes true and um, I really want to emphasize of the Again, ancestral knowledge of the, of course, Lenape people, um, but also like I feel like there is a lot of overlap between the indigenous people from Persia and Iran and the indigenous people from here and then how we can just bring back really like that wisdom to the future of climate and how we can connect people through like a very, very primitive, about absolutely wise ecology that it goes back to centuries back and it's got like super invisible because of capitalism um, we don't go that there but um, but it's really I'm just so happy that I want to bring the whole um, community of I want to emphasize of the people that they know the land they know water mm -hmm. they understand um, the holistic aspect of um, plants and water. So uh, hopefully it's not just only immigrants, but like I'm really emphasizing here in the kinship between uh, brown and black body and the migrants mm -hmm. um, community yeah. come together, yeah. Beautifully put. <laughs> what about you, Rico? I know we diverged a little bit, but what's your first, um, you know, love at first sight with a, with a public artwork or, or a garden or, or some kind of landscape experience that maybe even impacted your practice? Um, I'm going to speak very slowly now. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Uh, yeah, because going, you think a lot. Mm -hmm. I, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for that. No, it, it, it goes back to when I was a, an undergraduate student in Minneapolis um, five years ago, <laughs> plus 30. <laughs> um, and just all the public art that I experienced um, in that city, Minneapolis and Chicago, you know, after I first left New York. I mean, Oldenburg, um, I mean, there's just so many names that sort of escape me right now, but um, just to tie in the garden part of it in Minneapolis, there's the Walker Art Institute, mm -hmm. and I think I was there at the end of the 80s when the sculpture garden first opened, and it was uh, Klaus Oldenburg, Spoon and Cherry, and Martin Purrier, and, um, and uh, I, I guess since then, um, that garden has uh, changed a bit. They have some new additions. I was just, just there in September doing a project with High Point Press and, uh, and uh, had some time on my hands. And so I went to the garden, the sculpture garden, and walked around and was happy that the, the spoon and cherry was there. But the, you know, like in terms of like, you know, uh, impact, I don't have any sort of like uh, um, profound way of speaking um, specifically to your question other than to say that my connection to all of that, to that period, to that garden, it, it, um, in that place um, takes me back to specific memories and like my early development as an artist. Um, 
and uh, because that was such a significant moment for that city, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it's still like this again this signature sort of uh, place there. Um, so yeah, there's just specific memories, memories of, of being like, you know, again, I'm gonna refer to my wonderful wife being in love because we met there. We met in Minneapolis in the mid 80s and you know, we went to that sculpture garden. And uh, so there's a lot of connections that way, you know, so but, um, so, but yeah, but you know, like the more profound answer would be that, that's, you know, I started out um, I started out, I'm still a sculptor. I studied sculpture um, and uh, have expanded there. <laughs> <laughs> That's some of it. Um, so yeah, I was always just very, very, uh, you know, I mean, I worked for Richard Serra briefly in the early 90s. And uh, so Richard Serra is somebody that comes to mind in terms of like, you know, work in the public realm, mm -hmm. very specifically, um, what was the controversial piece down the uh, Tilted Arc? Yeah. yeah, that caused so much. Um, it was in front of a bank, is that what it was? It was like, a, it was like. A it was blocking the entrance obstructing, to a bank. Obstructing um, people's Passage. Passage. So he's, he's an artist who works with really large iron pieces, I guess steel. is the material. Steel, yeah, steel. Yeah, steel pieces. Yeah. And he was commissioned by a bank to um, have a, you know, a beautiful artwork in front of the plaza. And his response to that, which is a very Diego Rivera communist response, was that he was going to build a massive, massive, massive uh, you know, steel curtain that would oblige people to just take the longest route in order to get to a their long ATM and, machine. Long and contempl <laughs> contemplative route. Yeah. To, maybe you don't need that, mo that money. <laughs> Perhaps you shouldn't take it. No, I don't know. I'm projecting. <laughs> Hopefully we're not recording this. <laughs> we are. <laughs> But, you know, but Richard Serra's, you know, in that work, you know, and like a lot of public, uh, um, large public sculptural works um, from the period, you know, where it uh, was something that was really important to me and made an impact, long story short. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had more questions, but do you guys have questions? <laughs> We have one over there in the back. On the outer track or the outside of the station? There, there's a, it's true in the subway too. Um, where the track wall is, is considered legally an attractive nuisance. So if we put artwork, two or three reasons, but one I learned very early on, um, when Alex Katz was, uh, he was up for a project years ago, and he came in and he decided he didn't really want to do that project, so he shared with us what he wanted to do, but of course we could only do projects we were budgeted for. And he wanted to take cows and put them on, you know, on the track walls. And Alex, I hope you don't mind me telling this story. <laughs> and <clears throat> besides the logistics that we didn't have a project for that or funding for that because that wasn't really the issue, we, I found out, this is just a few years in, that legally it's really a hard thing to put something that's going to attract someone to go across that track in any way. That if something happens, we are legally, we attracted them to come there. So we, we couldn't do that. That was, that was one of the reasons, and, and really enough of a reason that we didn't go past there. You know, we also can't main them on, a, you know, the, tr the subway runs, used to run, and does again 24 hours a day. So you don't have an opportunity, and you have to go across a live, tra a live track to maintain. Now, there are conditions, and there are exceptions to everything we ever say. So, you know, but that is a very expensive proposition, uh, what it costs to stop a train 
and do something like that or bring a work train in is phenomenally expensive, more than the project would ever cost, you know. Um, so that's the main reason on, on the tracks, uh, you know. We have another question. Yeah, good evening. Um, I just want to say that I frequent 167th Street. I am from that community, and um, for me, being from the Bronx, it changes the vibration for me. Um, and that's really important, especially when the, the craziness is going on. That impacts me emotionally. And I also want to ask, is there a map? Because you said it's 40 something. I wonder if there's a map. Like, if I did decide to do a tour, where is the map? Okay www.new, <laughs> and this is our new website, dot .mta .info, and I think it's probably Cheryl backslash art, right? Is it still that? I think the old one still works. The old one still works too, but go to the new site because it looks so beautiful, and we're, we're slowly filling out each project, so you'll see, when you go in, you'll see some of the older web design. But if you look at, at Rico's to start, you will see the beautiful new design. Um, so it's online. There's about, there's, you know, work. There's information about every project there. Um, so it works a little different if you go in and you look for Rico or the station name, and then it tells you more, and you'll see quickly where it is. But that is a very thorough, beautiful new, we'll have it, it'll take a long time to have it totally filled out with 350 projects. But the older information is there now. Okay. Um, <laughs> good thing. Could yeah. I answer your question about the first public art? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question about the first public art that had, uh, that had an impact on you. You know, when, when I, you know, I didn't come to New York to be a public art administrator. There's not at all, but I did have an arts administration background. Um, and a lot of public art I knew at that time, which is going to age me if I haven't already told you this, if I haven't already said that, um, was sculpture. And what had, by that time, starting to be called plop art, that something had been plopped in a plaza. But the piece that had a, a huge impact on me right as I came to work at the MTA was Mary Miss's piece with David Child, SOM, at the Cove uh, down at the tip of Manhattan near Battery Park. Do you know this piece, Cove, Mary Miss's piece? It was, it's, it's a sculptural piece that you walk up into and it loosely has the form, design of a, the crown. And you walk up, you know, just a certain, a small amount, and you're in this crown shape, open form, and it's landscape too, so there, there's a walkway that you're going through the edge of the water and you come up there. And I did that, and you look out at the Statue of Liberty. So you are grounded physically in that place as you look out and experience this. And I heard Mary speak at a college art, of course, you know, and say, or one of those conferences, and say that her goal was to create this intimate moment in this very public space. Now, for years, every time I said that, I gave Mary credit. More recently, I, I just grab it and talk about it because that has influenced my my role so much that that's what you want. That's what that's what Rico did. That's what you do. That's what we're trying to do is to create. It tells people they matter. They matter because somebody cared to do this, and they it matters that they have a good experience. Mm -hmm. So when an a, an artist is sort of artist, are, I think almost always when they're creating public art with us. I think they're there, though they may not consciously, you know, be aware of that specifically. But when they do that, when you do that, you know, experience, when you have that experience, then the work has been phenomenally successful. Mm -hmm. so. I Can I say something? Thank yeah. you for sharing that memory. But also intimacy is really important. Yes. really important and also I think something else that I see like why Riku's work is like that you know vibrated and just it's imagination it's like create 
this kind of opportunity for people to be able to imagine and reimagine. I think that's the magic. That's the way that artists can work around like, yes, we know the community, yes, we did the research, yes, but what, what about the future? Mm -hmm. And where is that intimacy and imagination, a big meet? That, that's the way that, you know, everybody just gets like really vibrated. Yeah, I agree. I'm gonna say something. Say something. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, it is about like, you know, really thinking about, again, like the viewer, the audience, which is paramount. And I think that that sort of covers everything else. Hopefully that takes care of like, um, at least for me, like concerns about like shelf life. Mm -hmm. a per it, it, of course it's permanent, but you know, I'm an artist. I'm just trying to transform like the energy. Um, that's it, you know. <laughs> I could say place, I could say people. I like the, I like the, who's my friend back there? This said vibration. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to bring energy, good energy, and hopefully some light, and I hope that, you know, people get that humbly, you know. I'm not humble, but <laughs> no, I'm joking. Hum humbly bringing some of that, you know, um, to the world, and I'm happy that we were able able to do that in that in this project and other projects, and hopefully there'll be opportunities to do more. I'm excited for projects, um, for opportunities to do more projects in the public realm, and hopefully they will be. Is successful. I think we also are excited. <laughs> yes, another question. My name is Cecil Brooks. I grew up in this neighborhood. Thank you so much for, for everyone on side, the artists, all of you putting this together. Um, so I, I'm, really, I'm really curious about the green space aspect. And um, I'll try not to geek out too much. I, I work in government, so we're supposed to know everything. But the Bronx has the, the most green space out of any borough, and um, some of the one of the parks, Spelling Bay Park, three times the size of Central Park, biggest park. So I'm really curious, especially since waterways and green space has been such a, uh, a like a persistent theme I've been hearing, and the Bronx is supposed to be known for that. Um, what, what are some 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 missed opportunities or some I guess underrated spaces here that you've seen that each of you have seen that more artists or more residents should be question. Who's going to take that one? You're the garden. <laughs> I think I'm going to make more work. <laughs> <laughs> True, there are a lot of green spaces. It's a beautiful, beautiful borough. Yes. I'm always curious, obviously, uh, both of you, all of you as artists, uh, we're talking about your success now. Uh, I'm more interested in the very, very beginning during the difficult times. And the reason why I post the question that way is that um, we created uh, an alternative arts center in the South Bronx 13 years ago and it's still going. Uh, What's the name of it? It's called the Fogon Center for the Arts. And as artists, and I'm not an artist, you know, you're worried about how am I going to pay for the space. If you are a performing artist, if you're a spoken word artist, you're worried about entrance fee because I have to give the space, the, the owner of the space, a percentage of the, of, of the, uh, of the, of the door. Mm -hmm. What if only two people come in and I'm on the hook for all of this money? So what we did, what I did with another business partner of us, when we bought one of these properties about 13 years ago, we eliminated that factor. So for the last 13 years, it's been free for any curator, any visual artist, any performing artist, to come and just home in their craft, uh, primarily bronze-based artists, and to take that mindset away from them mm -hmm. whereby you just go and become creative. And my question to you guys at the very, very beginning, how difficult was that for you guys? Oh, it's still difficult. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little less difficult now, but yeah, but uh, um, yeah, it was difficult, you know, to journey 
like I said, you know, it's a whole, yeah, it's not really like just a matter of like, you know, being like, uh, I mean, I think artists are pretty uh, inventive, scrappy. Resilient. Resilient, that's the word. <laughs> Resilient, you know, hopefully. So yeah, it's a, it's a journey. Um, so, and I'm not sure I, 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 I'm answering your question or like, what, what was it like in the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it was a struggle, the but. Struggles, uh, I mean, as a, as, a, as a painter, when you didn't have enough to be able to buy paint to, to be able to paint or the canvas or, or, or variables of that nature that required you to, 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 to do what you now do at the very beginning. And if somebody would have eliminated the, the, the opportunity or provided you with the opportunity to do exactly what you now do so successfully. I, 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 um, I, I have a BA from Bethel College in Minnesota, and I went to Yale for MFA. Fortunate, I applied to two schools. I, the top, I did, I didn't get accepted at my top choice. <laughs> Can't believe I'm saying this on camera. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I had some students from that top choice in my studio a few days ago. Um, but I got into Yale, um, and uh, you know, tiny violin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I moved to New York in the early '90s. So that's 30. I, it's always the math. 30 years ago. 30 years ago, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was listening. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a long journey, you know. Also adding it's long, that long, it's yeah. not that linear, it's, it's, you know. It's not that linear, no. So yeah. it's really good to talk about the beginning and the struggle, but I don't think like I can see even if I want to analyze so hard myself, it's not like that was this and this was this destination and now I'm here. It's so like um, integrated together. Uh, one day is this thing is issue, one day is another. Um, it's, n it's financial problems, but also it's the persistency, it's the discipline, it's who's your tribe, who's there for you. It's also like political issues that comes on your way. So there are like many, many, many things that is still, we're still struggling and we're still doing it. It's not like a creamy sweet way that success is really like a abstract good sweet thing to think about it but i don't know how we can define it i think success is for me it's just like i'm able to create still thank to um my own persistency and also like other supporters and things that happening yeah um, oh god i just want to say bless you uh because I came to New York as an artist, and I'm still an artist, and I've been an artist every day I've been here, and the struggle is unbelievable. While I took the day job, because I had to know, you know, I, one day I would, how was I going to live the rest of my life when I didn't do this job? But I never quit painting, and I'm reminded today, I was reminded yesterday, how hard it is for artists, and yet they continue. They continue to paint, they continue to do. Some are so very privileged that their, their talent, and, and to some degree mine was, but that the talent was seen and shown and exhibited an opportunity. But thanks to people like you, I hope you're an example. I hope everyone in here that can buy a work of art from an artist will buy that work of art that has an opportunity to open a building or give a show or, you know, buy a piece of work will do that because it is tough. And opportunity is everything. So the more you can create that, the better. Well, also I think like um, there is a disconnection definitely between when we say artists, organizations, and like government and society. It's just like everything is so categorized in their own world that people like you that bring all this together, it's just really like what we need. And also I think just 
touching a little bit maybe on the subject that why in the Bronx we don't have like a more art in the garden and waterways and all those themes. I think it's also it's not about like which artist what's what what's it's just more about like I think all the organizations and government has to have artists more involved in policy making mm -hmm. in decisions in just like because we need creative minded again I emphasize of imagination and reimagination we so I think in every single governmental organization we need a team of artists mm -hmm. to just rethink about the about the city about the urban planning about then it's just not like that artist let's just buy their work it's good but mm -hmm. we have i think more potential than that yeah i agree <laughs> do we have any more questions yes so um piggybacking off what you guys just spoke hi my name is Carmen. um the journey and the struggle that you guys have gone through what would you tell earlier you keep going <laughs> Eat better. <laughs> oh yeah, that too. Um, I wanted to show, because I, I, I forgot to show what will be hung from your guys' work in this building. And oh. here we have uh, some of the river water series. Well, really, I think they were fountains from gardens or at least inspired by water. Um, and this will actually be hung in the pool lounge next to a work by another artist who deals with water, um, Madeline Hollander. So that will be a nice conversation. Uh, and then Rico is actually on this floor, I believe, and this is where he will be. Um, there will be a nice play with the wood and the rays from this beautiful portrait. So there we go. I wanted to pin that. Diane Carroll. Yes. I believe born in the Bronx. And her father was a subway driver, I think. Yes. Now you tell me. <laughs> I, I think in there, we, I also am so thankful that corporations and companies like Brookville are commissioning artists and really getting in, not buying, quote, corporate art and putting something to have on the wall that but having thoughtful curators look and reach out to people in the community is an amazing, wonderful thing. It goes a very long way. Thank you. Thank you all yes, for coming. Thank you. thank you for the three guests. And um, as Sandra was just saying, thank you to Third Bankside. Thank you to Brookfield for giving us this platform for highlighting the work of artists. Um, and yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.